our wonderful guest speaker, Steve Chupp. You can come on up, Steve, if you want. Yeah, yeah as many of you know, we, uh, we had the LifeLinks uh, conference in Winnipeg over this last week. Just a wonderful time. We are a LifeLinks church. We are part of a wonderful church network of support, of love, of prayer, of vision. Uh, and ultimately, we are connected to an amazing organism, for lack of a better word, that has reached all across Canada, down into the States, even, 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 even. into the States. Wow. Even in the unholy lands of Indiana. <laughs> there is church and there is hope. Thank God. And throughout the entire world. And so... Steve Chupp, he's just one of the wonderful leaders of the LifeLinks Network. Uh, formerly. Formerly, as of earlier this week. But not late. But not late. Formerly, but not late. So, you know, I just want to give him a warm welcome. He's been here two, uh, two years ago, I think. Yep. He's a wonderful guy, and so I'm sure he'll have uh, lots of great stuff for us. So, Steve, Thank turn you. it over to you. All right, we have a new microphone. Let's, we got it working? Can you, can you hear? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I told him I'd mess with him. All right, yes, we have the Life Links Conference. I've been a very happy part of that leadership team. I've pastored a church in Indiana for about 36 years. Turned that over to my successor a few years ago, but for a number of years, I've also been on the Life Links leadership team. This last week, we announced to the Life Links leaders and churches that we have kind of tweaked our mission statement. And uh, we, it doesn't necessarily reflect a change in values or vision, but it's a better way of saying what we really want to do. And so the new mission statement is building churches that advance the kingdom. And so our desire is to build churches, to strengthen churches, encourage churches, help churches become healthy and healthier, complete their mission, uh, so that we can advance the kingdom. And it so happens that I had already felt led to teach this morning on keeping the kingdom first. So I'm quite excited about how this all fits together. But we want to be a group of churches that advance the kingdom. And uh, I have a wife and three daughters and seven grandchildren. Uh, as I've told people before, and as you may have heard other people say, I should have had grandchildren first. They're a lot more fun. <laughs> children are a lot of bother, but you have grandchildren are great. Except they wear you out! I know why we had kids younger when we were younger. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, it's great to be here again. Last time my wife was here, it's, uh, I wish she could be here this time, but not, not to be. So I'm, I'm really, uh, I always enjoy being, well, it's only been a couple of times, but I just enjoy being with your church because you're so friendly. Do you know that? I don't know if you mean to do, do that or if by accident. That is a wonderful thing to have a friendly church. Because there are people wanting to come to church. There are people, you know, did you know that at least in the States, and I don't think it's too far off in Canada, 80% of people who are unchurched will come to church if they're invited by a friend. And, if, and, and they'll come back if the church is friendly. Wow, that's an amazing thing. We want to reach people and reach our community. And so this church is friendly. You're doing great stuff. But let me uh, get into my topic here today, keeping the kingdom first. In May... I was in Zambia. We have a missionary in Zambia, and I was there to visit them. I'm now the missions pastor of our church, so I do some mission work. And I met a couple in Zambia uh, named Matt and Savannah Mackey, and I, and I met their dog. Let's go to the next slide. And, and this is Matt and Savannah and their dog, Baxter. Everybody say, hi, Baxter. He, you know, he can't hear you, but it's still a good thing to do. So he is a, um, what is he, a, a lab? A Doberman. No, he's a, he's a Doberman pup. So here's what happened. Matt got up that Sunday morning. They're involved in, in Zambia with a project called Zambia Project, and they're a church planting movement doing some great work in Zambia. So anyway, Matt and Savannah have this dog, Baxter. Savannah's mother was visiting from South Africa in their home in, in Zambia, and one afternoon she decided to have a little piece of bread and take a nap. So she had her bread, she had a little bit left over, and she left it on the nightstand, and she took off her family heirloom ring, uh, you know where this is going, and put it beside on the nightstand. This ring had been passed down from generations of mothers, it was a very meaningful ring. And when she woke up, the ring was gone, and the bread was gone, and she immediately suspected, Baxter! This pup came in, snarfed the whole thing down. So, Matt did what anybody would do in a situation like that, freaked out, and the second thing that he did is went to Google. And he did a Google search and found out, how do you get a ring out of a belly of a dog? 
And so they've had a peanut butter and bran and oatmeal and all kinds of things. And then, as Matt says, he, he uh, took uh, Baxter out in the morning when it was dark to do Baxter's thing. And he had his torch, as they call it in South Africa, or a flashlight. And he would follow Baxter around the yard. Yeah. And he thought, what are the neighbors thinking that I'm out here with a flashlight looking at the back end of my dog all the way through? So nothing happened for two days. Uh, Matt and Savannah then went for a run two days later, and they were running through the town, and they came across this bridge where there were a lot of people, and Baxter stops. And Matt says, Baxter, not here, not now. And Savannah, being very helpful, just keeps running. Okay, so she keeps running, Baxter stops, does his do, and so uh, Matt goes and gets a stick, and he starts his work, and he finds the family heirloom ring, and he puts it on the stick. Next slide, please. Next, voila! And he hollers to Savannah way off in the distance, I found the ring, okay? So that's a great story. So you wonder, how in the world does this crude story have anything to do with the kingdom? When you preach as long as I can have, you can make any story fit any sermon. But anyway, that's not the point. The point of it is this. What did Matt know about that dog that his neighbors did not know? Why was he following that dog around like that? Why was he having that flashlight following up? What does he know about that dog that we don't know? And in that dog was a treasure that their family valued very highly. He did clean the ring off very thoroughly before he gave it back to his mother-in-law. So Jesus came to earth to tell us about the kingdom of God. And he told stories to illustrate what the kingdom of God was all about. For example, this one in Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a dog, in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field when a man found it. Crafty, now this isn't in the original language maybe, but it might be. Crafty guy that he was, he hid it again. So here's a guy going through a field. He sees something sticking out of the ground. He uncovers a little bit, and here is a fantastic treasure. So he buries it again. He hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. What does that guy know about that field that I don't know? What does Jesus know about the kingdom that I don't know? Sometimes people have this concept, whether they're Christians or not, that if you come and follow Jesus, it's going to be so hard, and you can't do any of the fun stuff, and you got to go to church and hear dog stories. It's like, I feel so sorry for you being a Christian. No, Jesus didn't say that at all. He said, when you discover the kingdom, you're not going to be grumpily giving anything up. You're going to discover something so powerful, treasureful, wonderful, valuable, that you're willing to give up anything for joy. He went and sold everything he had, and he bought that field. Second parable, right after that. Again, in Matthew 13, 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, and when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. What are we missing? Why do we get grumpy when we have to sacrifice to serve Jesus? This guy said, I have found something so amazing. So Jesus put these... These these, uh, teasers out there about what the kingdom of God is like to try to say, if you guys would just have a clue about where I came from and what I'm bringing to earth, heaven, you would give up everything you had for it. And so I think that we need to ask this question, what are we missing in the church? And what is it about this, uh, this kingdom? So here's my key thought. Jesus made the kingdom of God a really big deal. But God's kingdom can seem vague and abstract to us. You know what I say? Lots of times I tell people uh, when I'm teaching on on the kingdom of God, church people have a lot better time describing church than kingdom. Are we missing something? The kingdom can seem vague or abstract to us, but if we're going to keep the kingdom first, we need to understand what it is and how to keep it first. Uh, Even in the Psalms, 
they talked about the kingdom of God. Psalm 145, verse 11 to 13. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Remember that word dominion. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion, dominion, remember that word, endures through all generations. And then Jesus said in Matthew 6, the kingdom of God should be our first priority. Seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here's another translation. Jesus will, God, God will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Wow, what incredible promise. So this thing kind of goes on and on. Also, Matthew 6, 9 to 10, the kingdom of God is the first request, easy for me to say, uh, the first request in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9 to 10. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We worship God first. Jesus said here, worship God. He's a wonderful Father. And then the very first thing that we're supposed to ask is this, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have to understand what the kingdom is. We have a hard time grasping this because we don't really live in a realm of kings and kingdoms so much. But back in the day, there were all these kings, and you read about them in the Bible and you read about them in world history, that there were all these kings and they had their kingdoms. And they were maybe just kings of smaller city states rather than huge, vast territory. And it made a huge difference what kingdom you were in. Was your king ruthless? Was he benevolent? Was he kind? Was he gracious? Whatever kingdom you were in, whoever ruled you actually determined your safety, your provision, and your purpose. Was he benevolent? Was he approachable? Did he rule well? Many were not. They were selfish, abusive, tyrants. And so you have that situation. This morning, this morning, I'm reading in the news, and it says this. It's happening right now, even as we... Well, I'm speaking. You're not supposed to speak. Even as we speak... (laughs) Sorry. Thousands of people are traveling across Central America en masse to the U.S., and they're stuck at Mexico's southern border. Some of them broke through the Guatemalan border uh, fences, but then clashed with Mexican riot police. What's going on here? Uh, uh, the migrants, mostly from Honduras, say they are fleeing violence and poverty, and include women and children. An estimated 10% of the population of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras have fled danger, forced gang recruitment, and dismal economic opportunities. Somebody from Honduras said it this way, they are not seeking the American dream, but fleeing the Honduras nightmare. Years ago, during the uh, civil rights movement, there was a guy named Eldridge Cleaver, and uh, he was an activist. He He did some illegal things. He was uh, he, he, he was, there was a warrant out for his arrest, so he fled to France, and he stayed there for a few years, and he finally said this. Now, this is a, kind of a cheesy statement for an American to make, but, but, but go beyond it, okay? He said this. He was in France. He was wanted in the United States. He said, I would, be, I would rather be in prison in the United States than free anywhere else in the world. Wow, that was a big shift in his ideas. What is he saying? What are we saying here? There's, there are these places where we can live. Now, in those days back then that Jesus was describing this, so much was determined by your king. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're not talking about a territory. We're not talking about land or a place. We're talking about the rule of the king, the dominion of the king. So everywhere you see the kingdom of God in the Bible, it has to do with the rule of that king and how uh, benevolent he is. So how did this become so important? It started in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, God created man and a woman. He put them in this beautiful place. They had everything they needed for freedom and joy. Those are two huge words. They had everything, Adam and Eve had everything they needed for freedom and joy. They were under God's rule. Some people say, I don't want God to rule over me. Now think about it, think about it. In the beginning, God ruled over mankind. He ruled over the earth. 
And it was wonderful. They were free. They were joy. They enjoyed God. They enjoyed his rule. They knew he was benevolent, cared about them, and that he had their best interest in mind. Except that Satan had already fallen in heaven. He was down on the earth, and he was trying to do something about this rule of God. He didn't like the fact that God ruled, and he didn't. Now, here's a, fact, a, a fun fact about the kingdom of God. Daniel 6.26, you can't destroy God's kingdom. Daniel 6, 26, for he is the living God, he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. So Satan can never get destroyed God's kingdom. He can't, he can't do anything about it. But his smart guy that he is, he decided that he would set up a counter kingdom. So he came to earth, Satan did, to set up a counter kingdom. How was he going to establish this counter kingdom? Well, it was really, really simple. He came to Adam and Eve and he said, did God really say that you can't eat of the trees of the garden? No, no, God said we can eat anything except for that tree. If we eat that tree, we're dead. Satan said, no, God's just, you know, he's just trying to keep you oppressed. He's still saying that today to people. He's just trying to keep you down. If you ate from that tree, then you'd be like God. That'd be really cool. So they ate of the tree. The woman ate, and the man was there with her. Don't give the woman such a hard time. But the man was right there with her, and they ate, and their eyes were opened in a really naughty way. And all of a sudden, they experienced things they'd never experienced before. Instead of freedom and joy, they experienced pain and guilt and shame, and they started covering themselves up. And then they started hiding from God, and the whole thing went south. And in that moment, Satan's kingdom came to earth. In that moment. You know why? Because in Romans chapter 6, it says, your obedience determines your master. Your obedience determines your master. Don't you realize, Paul said, that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master? You can choose sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God and receive his approval. So all Satan had to do to establish his kingdom on earth was to, do what the pe to get the people to do what they had been giving to God, obedience. Because once they gave themselves in obedience to Satan, he became their master. Wow. Every moral decision we make is a choice of whose kingdom we're going to be part of. Does that mean that every time you sin, you lose your place in the kingdom? No, I'm not talking about that. But what it does mean is who's going to tell us what to do? Who's going to be our master? And when we, and Paul says this, if you could choose sin, you know, that's a big problem. In Ephesians chapter uh, 2, Verse 2, it says, you used to live like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan. The mighty prince of the power of the air, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And so we have this amazing situation. When I first read this verse in the Bible, I thought, no, nah, this can't be. Now, this next one, 1 John 5, 19, we know we're children of God and the world around us is under the power and control of the evil one. Some translations will say the whole world is under the control of the evil one. You mean Satan really has... I thought God was sovereign, God ruled over... Yes, he does. But because the world has chosen, and mankind, and ever since Adam and Eve, have chosen to, to disobey God, we are under the... So the world, that is, is under the power and control of the evil one. He has brought his kingdom to the earth. And we're suffering for that to this day. So way back in the beginning, God uh, promised that he was going to bring redemption. In Genesis 3.15, he talks to the serpent, who Satan came in the form of a serpent, and he says, from now on, you and the woman will be enemies. Your offspring and her offspring will be enemies. There's this clash of kingdoms. He will crush your head, meaning the seed of the woman, the, but you will strike his heel. That's about Jesus coming. So what happens? Fast forward all the way to the time of the Bible, the New Testament, and Jesus comes free from Satan's rule. Jesus never obeyed Satan. Remember when Jesus said, he has nothing in me? That's a really big statement. 
So Jesus came free from Satan's rule, never having experienced any guilt, and he came to free us so we could return to God's rule. John 14, 30 to 31. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the prince of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me. You see why that was so important? So that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be go- going. And then this huge verse in Colossians 1.13. Let- he rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. We have to help people realize, well, let me back up a little bit. As a young pastor, one of the things that I love to do is pray for people to receive Jesus. I don't pray for people to receive Jesus anymore. <gasps> It's terrible. What is he saying, Maud? Margaret, let's leave this church now. No, here's, what, here's the issue. Sometimes we'd be like, hey, do you want to receive Jesus? Here, have a Coke, have Jesus. It's all good, okay? We're not really helping people understand what's at stake here. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what did he say? What did he say? We know that part really well. The next part is teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. This is so crucial. That's why obedience is so important because we define our master. We decide our master whether we know it or not by that. And so when people come to Christ, I say, do you want to follow Jesus? Not do you want to ask Jesus in your life and be happy. Do you want to have your sins forgiven? Do you want to start living for Him and obeying Him? That's what's really at stake. And that's what Jesus did when He came, is He delivered us from one kingdom, rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's what God did. So, uh, a, a mission, mission, missiologist, a guy who really is, is studies missions, is named Ralph Winter, he says, the Bible consists of a single drama, the entrance of the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the living God into this enemy-occupied territory. That's what the story of the Bible is about. It's about God coming and establishing His rule on the earth through Adam and Eve, and He said, now you rule as well. And then Satan coming and bringing a counterfeit kingdom, and then all these years of the Old Testament setting up a physical, political kingdom to Israel to bring Christ who was going to destroy them from the real enemies, not their political ones, but the real enemy, Satan. And so this, the story of the Bible is a single drama, the entrance of the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God into this enemy-occupied territory. We have reduced Christianity to a personal relationship, and it is a personal relationship. But we've lost the vision of the kingdom in God's drama throughout history. Look at this. Well, let me say it this way. In order for us to really understand the kingdom of God and the Bible, we have to believe in Jesus and the devil. Now, we believe in them differently. We give our lives to Jesus. We want to do that. We trust Jesus. But we have to understand there's a devil. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said there are two opposite but equal extremes about, about Satan. One is we make too much of him. One is we make too little of him. And if what's happening is people are deceived into obeying him, and we are here to bring them out of that deception and pray that God's word will illumine them so they can understand. Revelation 12, 7 to 9, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. That great dragon was was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. That's why the kingdom is so important. There are people today on the Mexican border trying to get away from gangs and violence and poverty. There are people today not aware that they are under Satan's rule and they are dominated by fear and guilt and hopelessness. It, it is shocking to me. I, I teach stress management in businesses and schools and hospital staff. And it's shocking to me today how many youth are committing suicide? Who are just so hopeless. One of the leading causes of death in, in teenagers. Teenagers! It's just Satan 
who comes in John 10, 10 to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus kept trying to say this. You don't understand. This is a lot bigger than whether people are happy or not. This is about whether, this is a life and death issue spiritually as well as physically. So Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come. Let your rule and reign come. So when the kingdom of God comes, it's God's rule and reign. And it's actually saying, God cares about humanity that's been snookered and captivated by Satan. And he cares so much that he sent his son Jesus to bring this kingdom in. And then we're here to say, let's bring this kingdom in. Now, one of the fun things about my life is I have a rocket scientist friend. He really is a rocket scientist. He's in his 70s now. He lives in Goshen, Indiana, which is really weird because we don't have any rocket science going on there. But he's a, he worked on the Mars probe years ago. His name's Ron Klaus. And Ron Klaus has one of the best definitions for the kingdom of God that I know of. Doesn't take a rocket scientist, but it worked this time. So the kingdom of God is this. Let's look at this slide. The kingdom of God is a movement in history through which God is working to bring people, families, churches, and all institutions of society under the loving lordship of Jesus Christ. So families in our community are experiencing horrible marriage situations. Let's bring the kingdom of God to that. People in our society are, are, are struggling to make ends meet financially. Let's bring the kingdom of God principles into that. Let's bring God's provision into that. Every area of society, the kingdom of God means God cares, and He wants to bring His loving rule into that situation. It's where Jesus rules as Lord and Savior, where God and man are reconciled to each other, living in peace and joy and freedom, where people allow God and His love to rule their lives, where every area of life is affected by God's rule. But you know, some people say, well, I'm afraid God will control me, like I said before. You know what my dad did? My dad grew up in an Amish home. He had five brothers and five sisters. He was the oldest. He was given a lot of responsibility. He hated being Amish. He ran away from home at 15 and never looked back. So I didn't grow up Amish. He married a very non-Amish gal. But in the meantime, at 15, he ran away from home, and he said, nobody's telling me what to do anymore. I'm going to join the army. <laughs> True story. Well, how did that work out for him? He thought the army or the Amish was bad, but now he's got the army breathing down his neck, telling him what to do every minute of every day. He lied about it, lied about his age, got in when he was just barely 17. He enlisted when he was 16, and a neighbor vouched for him, and he was so happy to get out when he was barely 19 years of age. He didn't want anybody to tell him what to do. You know what? Somebody's going to tell you what to do. You just have to choose which master you want. You just have to choose which master you want. Is it going to be the army? Is it going to be the Amish? Is it going to be Satan? Is it going to be Jesus? I love Jesus. Once I found out what he's really like, it's like, wow, this might work out pretty good after all. I kind of like this. So what do we do? Uh, we put, let me give you some applications to this. We put the kingdom first, not the church. The church is not the mission. I love the church. I pastor a church for 30 years. This isn't a bitter pastor speaking, okay? <laughs> I love the church. I loved being a pastor. I bawled when it was older, but I knew it was time. But I live the kingdom every day. I love the church, but I live the kingdom. The, king, the church is not the mission. The kingdom is the mission. You know how many times Jesus spoke about the church? Two. See, he didn't like the church either. No, that's not true. <laughs> he only said church twice. You know how many times he mentioned the kingdom? Over a hundred times. I think, man, when I was a pastor, did I do that? Probably church, 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 kingdom. Why did he say that? Why did he do that? Here's what I think. I think that Jesus was, doing, was, was, was giving them, the, he said, let me paint you a picture of the kingdom. And if you get the kingdom right, you will get church right. But if you don't get the kingdom right, the church is going to be ugly. It's going to be self-centered, self-serving. It's going to be its own mission. Don't sit in my seat. <laughs> don't change my music. We got all these things that we think, the church is the mission, after all, and I'm the church, so it's all about me. It's all about me, Jesus. So, 
The church, the kingdom is the mission. So make sure we keep that right. The church is not the mission. The kingdom is the mission. The church is the vehicle of the kingdom. And when the church is functioning as the vehicle of the kingdom, it is a wonderful thing. Now, this isn't new to you. I'm trying to paint a really big picture and make a point. But Because you are kingdom people. You're doing great things in your community and around the world. Keep that clear. Keep the kingdom first. I talked to... Uh, I, I think I can get away with this. Uh, Keith um, Eberhardt is one of the pastors at the Rock Church in Winnipeg. When I was in Uganda, I went from Zambia to Uganda in this trip in May, and I met up with Keith Eberhardt. He's doing work in, in, um, in, in taking teams there. He was actually there for about three weeks, and it was hot. And he was back in the back country, and it was dirty and no electricity, and they were camping in the rough. I said, Keith, how do you do this? He said, let me tell you a secret, Steve. Now, I'm giving out a secret. But, you know, he told me, so I'm here. Uh, he said, I don't like it here. I don't like the bugs. I don't like the heat. I don't like the malarial medicine, anti-malarial medicine. He said, uh, this is not fun. But if one life can be changed, and in our verbiage today, if one person can come into the kingdom, or if the church can get a clearer idea of what the kingdom is all about, I will sell all I have to get it. It's just that much of a treasure. I thought, wow, that dude is a kingdom person. It's not about his comfort. It's about the kingdom. And he does it. He said it with a smile on his face. I said, Keith, you're crazy. No, he's for joy giving up all his creature comforts for the kingdom of God. Number two, always make missions about extending God's kingdom. We've done this in our church. We've had, we have eight full-time missionaries out from our church, and we send out a lot of teams. That's not to brag. That's just to say we are actively involved in missions. And so what it is is this. When we used to send people out to dig wells. We used to send people out to uh, plant churches. We used to send people out to um, work with orphans. We do still do all of those things, but we say... We are extending God's kingdom by digging wells and planting churches and caring for orphans because we want to keep the kingdom in view. We are going into this pla these places. In Zambia, I worked with Steve and Rachel Good, and what they do in Zambia is they, 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 they dig wells and they build schools and they build churches and... Um, they build health facilities, and they do all these things with development. Why? Because God cares about the whole shooting match. It's the whole part of their life. How can we bring the kingdom of God to Zambia? But that's the kingdom of God. There's nothing in our lives that is not a part of God's kingdom. There's a lot in my life that's not related to the church, but there's nothing that escapes the kingdom of God. So we always make missions about extending God's kingdom. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Thirdly, accept Christ, uh, the church's assignment. Help others switch kingdom. Read this earlier, Colossians 1, 13. How can we think about people to, that are far from God today that we can bring into this verse? God rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. There are people who need to be rescued and brought into the kingdom, whether they're sinning nicely or naughtily, if that's a word. Number four, live as a kingdom person, Matthew 6, He will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. We face a daily conflict of kingdoms. What are you going to watch? What are you going to eat? What are you going to smoke? What are you going to, oh, that's a big deal this week, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. What are you, you going to do with your life? What decisions? Every moral decision is a kingdom decision. In fact, just about every decision in our life is a kingdom decision because it relates to finances or relationships or whatever we do. And so we don't want to get paranoid. We just want to choose our master wisely. So for 36 years, I was a, I was a pastor of a church. I, they paid me to be good. And now I'm good for nothing. So when I finished pastoring, I thought, what am I going to do? I don't think I'm washed up yet. I still have a few years left. I know I'm 66 years old, as Kevin Beeson said the other day. I don't look a day over 64. Uh, but uh, 
I thought, okay, I still have some, years, some miles left here. What am I going to do with my life? How can I continue to be a person of the kingdom? So I'm helping out at our church to advance the kingdom, being mission pastor, doing different things like that. But I knew that God wanted me to do something with my life differently and take, somehow take what I've learned in life and take it to business. Take the kingdom of God to the marketplace. So I went back to school, which I never dreamed I would do. I got a master's degree in liberal studies. I was studying to be a Democrat, which is kind of weird. No, no, that's not true. Uh, but I, th- what it did is uh, this, this degree that I got is a, a degree that helps you do research and problem solving. And so I narrowed my focus down. By the time I got to my, um, it was a two-year degree, two and a half for me. Uh, by the time I got to my master's thesis, I wrote it on resilience, how to manage stress well. I was really interested in helping people with emotional health. But I know that men won't come to emotional health seminar, but they'll come to a resilience seminar. It's become resilient. Okay. So I developed this curriculum on, on resilience, and I've taken it, as I said, into hospitals, uh, staff. I've taken it into schools. I've taken it into businesses. Why? Because God cares about people who are stressed out and ready to kill themselves. Now, that's the extreme, but just stressed out. See that? Did you see that? hear that song from 21 Pilots, Stressed Out? Look it up. It's really cool. Watch the video on YouTube. 21 Pilots Stressed Out. Anyway, that's different. But uh, so people are, st- God cares. What I, when, and so I don't, my, it bothers my mom a bit, who's a bit religious, that I'm not pastoring anymore. And she says, now, when you go into this, these businesses, Stevie, don't call me that. Uh, when you go into these businesses, Stevie, do you tell them about Jesus? Do you preach? I said, mom, 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 that's, I can't do that. But what I do is I, I actually do include some scripture verses, if they'll let me, and I tell them how to overcome stress because God cares about that. And then I have these great sidebar conversations with participants in my seminar. We're taking the kingdom of God to the marketplace. What's your job? What, do you, what work do you do? Can you see it? Another thing that I've done because I don't believe I've had enough stress in my life is I've become a substitute teacher <laughs> because I've been going into these schools. And so I go in and I become a substitute teacher, and these kids abuse me horribly. In middle school. We have one of the biggest middle schools in the state of Indiana. And I go in there as a substitute teacher, and I think, this is the hardest job I've ever done, and they don't pay me nearly enough for it. And then I think about the teacher next door that's there every day. And the students. So I'm now meeting with the superintendent and how I can train their seniors in, that are just about to graduate and their teachers how to handle this mess. Because God cares. What's your job? Heating and air conditioning, HVAC, uh, whatever it is, you're serving the needs of people. Go in the name of Christ, be salt and light, see what kind of doors God opens up that you might even get a chance to help somebody switch kingdoms. That's really amazing. So my encouragement to you today is keep the kingdom first. My encouragement is to choose very wisely who you're going to obey. And help other people make that choice. And my encouragement today is to live as a kingdom person. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the privilege we have of being your sons and daughters. And coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your dear son. You did all the hard part. Help us to grasp what this kingdom is all about. And the impact of every decision of our lives every day. For those of us struggling with obedience, we pray you'll teach us how to have the grace and wisdom to make the right choices. And for those of us that have lost focus and we focused more on what we're going to get out of the church than give through the church in the kingdom, help us, Lord, to get back to what's really important and on your heart. Help us to be kingdom people with kingdom vision, to see Satan defeated and Jesus lifted up in our community and around the world and in our own families. In Jesus' name, amen.